Hi, this is Chuck. And this is Karen. And this is our show. What if it really works? A practical guide to spirituality. And the two people we have sitting before us are... Dr. Dean Wrighton, who is with the Institute of Noetic Sciences here in Petaluma, California. He's a senior researcher for them. You've been with the Institute for quite some time, haven't you? Yes. About 12 and a half years now. Yeah. And Dr. Tom Campbell, who is from uh, is an astrophysicist from NASA, and he lives in Huntsville, Alabama. So we're, he is the author of the My Big Toe, T-O-E, Theory of Everything. And Dr. Raiden is, uh, has written his latest book, is Entangled Minds, Extrasensory Experiences in a Quantum Reality. And we brought you these two gentlemen today because they have such divergent viewpoints and yet they have so many things that they have in common in regard to the work that they do. So we like to sh share them with you today. So we appreciate both of you being here with us. Well, thank you, Karen. Thank you. So let's, let's begin at, with a simple question. What is consciousness? <laughs> well, 25 words or less, yeah. <laughs> what, is, what is consciousness? To give you the short answer, consciousness is a information field. Consciousness is information. Reality is information. And consciousness is a digital information system. Okay, now that's, I'm not sure that gives you the, what is consciousness? There's lots of ways then from there that you can, you can bubble this up. Um, we have the, the consciousness that people talk about like I'm conscious and you're conscious and I would call that little c consciousness. That's, that's kind of our local awareness, if you will. And then I think of a, a big c consciousness, which is the larger consciousness system and that's this digital information field. Mm -hmm. So it starts from the idea that uh, reality is information, whether it's our sense information, which defines you know, this physical reality to us, um, there's more to it than just that, because consciousness is much bigger than just this physical reality. It, uh, physical reality, I guess I should say, uh, um, the concept that um, reality is objective. Okay, that's what we think of in this physical reality. This is an objective reality. Reality is objective only in a, an approximation. In a larger view, reality is this digital information field and where the uncertainty is small then it approximates being objective and that's where the physical world then and the well, I shouldn't say the physical world there's lots of things in the physical world that have lots of uncertainty and they appear not to be too objective but that's the that kind of defines the objective reality that traditional science works in the hard sciences work in it's a it's an approximation um, a subset of a larger reality. Just like um, Newtonian physics is a subset of a larger reality described by relativity and quantum mechanics. And it's not that Newtonian physics doesn't work anymore, it works very well, but only within the range, you know, where it, where it holds, which means not too small, not too fast. Then Newtonian physics is, is good, useful physics. But it's only a subset of a much bigger view. And then when you expand that view out again, you find out that quantum mechanics and relativity are just a subset of a bigger view. And objective physics is an approximation within a subset. So consciousness is information, if uh, in the you know, 25 words or less version. <laughs> Yeah, I've been counting it overall, it's way more than 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, wasn't it? Uh, we had a, a talk here the other day by uh, Peter Russell, a well-known consciousness researcher, and he, he said something I hadn't heard before, which is if you take the word consciousness and you think about what Ness does to it at the end, it, it takes a process and it turns it into a noun. And so we, we talk about consciousness as though it is a thing, an object. And it really isn't. It's a process. So we, he, he talks about it in terms of awareing. Like instead of talking about consciousness, we should talk about awareing because it's about awareness, but it's a process, something mm -hmm. that's happening. And ultimately, it, if you keep going down this, this rabbit hole, you, you do end up with information. So I think a lot of physicists and philosophers are ending up with the notion that at, at bottom, as best as we can tell, there's something like 
relationships or information in some sense. Mm -hmm. So I agree with that. Stopping just interviewed Peter Russell about six months ago when he was at the uh, Monroe Institute in mm -hmm. favor. We were we happened to be there at the same time, mm -hmm. and and so I hadn't heard him say it the way that you just said it, which is very interesting information. I think, I think this was a new a new way of presenting it. That yeah, he was he was kind of toying with so. And I like it, too. I like it, too. Yeah. yeah. So what did you hear in Tom's description of consciousness that you understood, didn't understood, <laughs> dis disagreed with, have questions about? No, I think I agree with everything he said. That uh, ultimately our best description of the physical world is quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics at base is about information. And that actually fits in somewhat with uh, the yogic lore, or actually most of the, the ancient ideas, ancient esoteric ideas about the nature of reality, that uh, consciousness is wrapped in in some way. I mean, depending on which particular philosophy you go to, but Eastern philosophies in general put much more emphasis on the fundamentals of consciousness and the rest of the world emerging from that. And if that's the case, and one way, what word that we can use to describe that is something like information or knowledge or relationship, that sort of thing. So, so you have this interest, uh, Dean, in, in understanding these uh, extra scientific instances. Do you have the sense that a lot of this information has been in the mystical literature for a long, long time, and we haven't been able to take that route to find it? I wouldn't call any of this extra scientific. I mean, the experiences are what they are. People talk about strange flows of information from one place to the other, and the role of science then is to figure out uh, how do we tell the difference between uh, a hallucination and fraud from something that's real. So most of my work has focused on, on the issue of how do we know in principle whether the supposedly anomalous experiences like telepathy or precognition, how do we know that that's actually real? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's where the, the scientific road has been traveling down over the past century and a half to see, A, is it real? And then B, if it is real, what are the parameters that define mm -hmm. how to make it better or worse? And then further down is how do we create theories that don't do too much violence to what we know about the rest of the world that also explain these kinds of phenomena? So that, that's, that's what that enterprise is all about. And you find that in, in some of the ancient literature there are clues to this, yes? I think I'd say that on almost all of the ancient wisdom literature, it's talking about the same stuff, but from cultural perspectives where they didn't have the language that we have now. So they, you know, if, you, if you go back into the Vedas, for example, uh, a Vedic scholar would say, well, clearly this portion of the Vedas is talking about relativity or quantum mechanics or something like that. But it's a bit of a stretch to do that because the, there, there aren't any mathematics in the Vedas, at least the, uh, not as written, so there are interpretations. And the same goes for almost every esoteric tradition, that there's words that are used that are enculturated by the times and pointing, I would say it's more like pointing at what we're seeing now at the leading edge of science rather than describing it, because we have different, different language and different ways of describing things now. This is why I think actually that the, the future of science will intersect with the, the ancient past. Like the wisdom of the past, the future of science will intersect and both will be better as a result. Because either one alone is actually not the full picture. The ancient wisdom's pretty good, but they didn't have an iPhone. So you know, we learned something, <laughs> something new, and the, the hope is that we, with the, the new integration, that we learn fast enough so we don't accidentally uh, obliterate ourselves with technologies that are way more powerful even that we've already made. So a lot of the ancient wisdom is all about uh, getting your moral, uh, moral sense and ethics right so that you don't accidentally blow yourself and everyone else up. Mm -hmm. Tom, do you have any insight into that? Oh, well, I agree with Dean entirely. Uh, you can go back almost to the, the very first written documents that we have, you know, 4,000 years BC or so. That's probably when the Vedas and, and most of that um, uh, was being written and you will find a lot of wisdom a lot of things that are obviously true true based on your own experience 
but not true in the sense of scientific facts. They're, it's poetry. It's descriptive of experience. You know, this is, these are the things that I understand to be true, and here's why, and here's how you should live your life, and here's, here's what's important and what's not, and so on. It's very descriptive like that, but that's a f different animal than, than science. In order for that to become kind of modern day scripture, if you will, then we have to appeal to what I call the uh, high priests of science. You know, science is kind of the fundamental religion, if you will, of Western culture. Uh, I say that in a sense that, uh, you know, the priests of old used to tell the people kind of what to believe. What was right? You know, how did it work? And uh, now the scientists tell us in Western culture what to believe. If science says this is bogus and a bunch of crap, then most of the people won't think about it anymore. You know, that's it. They've been, they've gotten the word from the people who know. And instead of being the priests of, you know, what, four or five centuries ago, now it's the scientists, you know, of the 21st century. So in order to make what was kind of ancient wisdom into modern science, you have to find a way in which it all makes logical sense. In other words, you need an overview that pulls it all together, that indeed does, as Dean says, one day we're going to see, you see, that, that what's written, you know, what the Buddha said, what's written in the Vedas, what's, uh, um, you know, what we've learned, and it's not just Eastern religions, you know, we have, we have it through all sorts of mystical traditions. The problem is, some of it is, is very valuable, and we think of it as, as obvious truth, and some of it is kind of quirky that we think of as maybe dogma or somebody's imagination. How do you sort that out, which is which? Well, if you have a good overview of how does it all work, how is it that, you know, Buddha's saying that, uh, you know, this physical reality is an illusion? You know, what does that mean? How, would, you know, how does that translate in scientific terms? Then with this over theory, you can explain it. You can say, well, here's what the theology, here's what they were really talking about because it's logical now, it's scientific. And here's the paranormal part. Oh, well, it's normal now because it follows from this one overview, this one understanding. Um, here's how these uh, uh, what, reverse causality experiments work that have been done. Uh, here's how people at Pair Labs can modify uh, statistical distributions, if you will, of the way things happen, mind uh, affecting physical things. And then you can answer all those questions. Why is it that a man can use his intent and in feeling good or feeling bad and make ice crystals freeze into pretty crystals or ugly crystals? How does all that work? And then once you have an over theory, that explains how all that stuff is, and the same over theory also explains quantum mechanics and physics and does good science, answers those things, then you have an understanding that can bring it all together and it's all rational, it's all logical, it all kind of falls out in a pattern, and then that's, that's, uh, then it becomes science. But until we have that, then it's description, this person said that, you know, and they go on with, a, with a, a story, and their story is perhaps very credible or not, but it can't be a, you know, it can't be science until we understand how that story might work, you know, kind of the causality of it, if you will. If you understand the causality of it, then it can become science. So I, I agree completely with what uh, Dean had to say. Yes, you find lots of literature, uh, you know, Taoism, you read uh, Tao Te Ching, Tao, Tao Te Ching, I guess, something like that. Um, you can see the same sorts of things turn up in culture after culture after culture. And, and then when you finally understand what they're talking about, well, it applies here too. You know, it is a bigger picture. But we, we, need, a, we need the next step up to where what the Buddha said, why particles ought to be probability distributions, why the speed of light is a constant, all to derive from the same basic understanding. And that's, you know, that's the my big toe, basically. Mm -hmm. that's, where I'm, that's where I'm coming from. Could I ask a question? Sure. So uh, within the, your big toe, mm -hmm. uh, is there a small toe too? Um, 
Well, you can break it up into smaller toes. You can just explain, say, quantum mechanics or, and relativity and see that they both come from the same understanding. And that's basically what Einstein was looking for. And we could call that a little toe. Um, so, so you can just apply it to the, to the physical part and that would be a little toe. But then if you expand it and see the larger part where the paranormal, and paranormal just means that it's outside what physics or science now calls normal. Mm -hmm. you know, not so how, how do you apply the big toe to uh, things like quantum observer effects? Like how, how would it resolve the quantum measurement problem? Okay, it resolves, it resolves that problem by, by understanding exactly what's going on and, and what the mechanics are. The, you know, the double slit, let's say, is a kind of a fundamental thing in quantum mechanics. And as Feynman said, if you understand the double slit, you can understand the rest of it. That's kind of a, a key thing. And if you understand that reality is information, if you live in an information system, then we can call that a simulation. That's what simulations are. They're information systems. They're a, a virtual reality is a reality that's created out of information. Mm -hmm. So if our reality is created of information, we can look at it like a simulation. So once you start with that, and once you understand the structure of how that works, one of the attributes of this virtual reality is that there is a, uh, it's a, it's a probabilistic it's not a deterministic virtual reality. So if you had a deterministic virtual reality, you'd have to have a piece of data for everything. Uh -huh. Every particle, every state of every particle would require a piece of data. That becomes unwieldy and unnecessary. This is a probabilistic, statistical virtual reality. So you don't need all of that, you know, all that detail is unnecessary. You have a, what I call a, the um, probable future reality. And what that is, is a, a, basically in this information field, what's the probability that this will happen next delta t? And by next delta t, now I'm using something from the uh, simulation, you know, simulation cycles every delta t. Mm -hmm. So next delta t, what's likely to happen? And that's just, you know, trends, what you've got, you know, extrapolated next. And then you can say, well, given that that's true, what would happen next, and so on, you can work sure. this out. Of course, it gets rattier and rattier the further you go because you're piling up all these assumptions that what happened was actually what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So it's just probable. Now, one of the, I guess if you understand the reason why kind of we're here in, in this interaction is to learn and, and grow up. So we're in a learning lab, okay, and, and we uh, interact. We make choices. We have free will. And as we make these, these choices, we evolve the quality of our consciousness. And in more scientific terms, that means lower the entropy. In an information system, you have randomness is noise, high entropy. Mm -hmm. Information then is a low entropy arrangement of the bits, mm -hmm. if you will, a lower entropy. So the, the way consciousness evolves is by lowering the entropy, of the subsets of the information system, which are what we are. All right, now in this learning lab, to make it more useful and more educational for us. You need feedback. In any good schoolroom, you need feedback. And one of the feedback, there's, there's several feedback mechanisms, and one of them is that our intent modifies the probabilities in this future probable database. So we can actually have some influence on what happens next based on our intent. And then, of course, if it happens, then we live with that. So it's like you kind of create your own reality in that sense. Mm -hmm. But it's a multiplayer game. You don't create everything. It's not that you're alone, center of the universe, and everything's created for you. It's a multiplayer game. So then that gets back to the double slit. So everything, then, is just probability before it becomes the present. Everything in the future is probability before it becomes present. In the present, then, that's where we are. Things happen, we interact, and we make choices. And then after that, that becomes part of the, the past. And that's also probability. So the future is everything that could possibly happen and the probability that it might. The past is everything that did happen, which is our history thread, and everything that could have happened but didn't, and that's and the probability that it might have happened. You know? So again, we have all this probability uh, simulations. So think of the idea that it's all probability until it gets to the present where we're interacting with it 
as units of consciousness. So everything is probability to begin with. Well, particles like electrons, like photons, like buckyballs, all of these things, in a virtual reality, you only, everything begins as probability until somebody demands it in a measurement. In other words, until, until you open your eyes and look, there's no sense giving you a data stream that has the information in it that's what you're looking at. And what's behind you, there's no sense giving you a data stream on that. It's only what you're looking at. So you and only get a data stream. Who's doing the giving? The uh, larger consciousness system. You see a natural system that's in the process of evolving. And in order to evolve, just like biological systems, it found it more organization, lower entropy, more information to divide, break itself into pieces, and interact cooperative as a, you know, cooperatively as opposed to just one monolithic th thing. Mm -hmm. So that's then the system, is, the, is the, um, this information system. I just call that the, you know, the, the, larger inf you know, the larger consciousness system. So that's the system where pieces of that consciousness, and we're helping the larger system evolve as we evolve, because if we lower our entropy of our consciousness a little bit, the whole system, we're part of that system, so the whole system lowers it a little bit. So it's just a natural evolving system that, you know, survives by lowering its entropy, by not letting its entropy grow, which means move toward randomness. Mm -hmm. And we're just a piece of that. So then you have particles, their probability. That's just their natural state is a probability distribution until they need to be rendered in this multiplayer game. Well, in a multiplayer um, game, every player in the game gets their own unique data stream. So if you're working a player on a game, you're getting the data unique to that player, to where they, uh, you know, where they are, what they're doing, where they're looking, that sort of thing. So every player gets a unique data stream. And that's the rendering. Once something gets rendered, to you, then that's information that brings that into this reality frame. Once it's in the reality frame, it has to stay here. We can't look out this way and, you know, we're in California and then look again and now we're in Florida or someplace. Once you, you have a, a historical consistency constraint on it, otherwise it would be a kind of a crazy funhouse reality that wouldn't make sense, wouldn't be a good learning place. So once you measure it, that brings it, or in quantum mechanics talk, you know, it collapses the wave function, brings it into a, a piece of data that's now in this, this virtual reality. So then it has to stay that way. So if you look at the double slit as information, and you realize that it's not really the measurement, it's not the consciousness, although it takes a consciousness to make a measurement, it's really the information. And once you, once you see that, you can predict all the results of all the different kinds of double slit and the, and the erasers and all of that just fit perfectly consistently and it makes perfect sense. You know how, um, you know, you have the, um, I'm trying to think of that, what that experiment was called anyway, and in about 2000, there was a group of researchers who did a very neat double slit experiment where they had particles came into a, a plastic that then, when the particle hits, it puts out two. You know, so you get an entangled pair mm -hmm. that come out of that. And then they use one, hits, a, hits the screen, and decides whether it's, uh, you know, where the particles land, what the distribution is. Mm -hmm. The other one, its twin, goes through a, another process which either will or will not determine which slit it went through. But it doesn't make the first decision in that process of which slit it went through until after the other one's already been captured and it's mm -hmm. a done deal. Yeah, it's a late choice. Yeah, it's a late choice, yeah. So it's erasure, basically. It's right. a, you know, you have erasure experiment. So you have captured this data, then some 10 nanoseconds later, but 10, nano, 10 nanoseconds or 10 years really doesn't make any difference. Right. Time's not the issue. You make a choice over here, or it makes the choice, not the experimenter, but it makes the choice, depending on how it goes through a half silver mirror, or several of them, as to whether it keeps the information and says what slit it went through, or erases the information and doesn't have it. And of course, then you look at all the points and all the ones where you kept the information what slit it went through, all the slits that correspond to that one that you collected up here are all two little spots behind each slit. Right. And every time that you erase that information, 
you can get a distribution that's in a you know, diffraction pattern. So all of that is, then falls out as being perfectly understandable and predictable from, you know, from this theory. And the thing that's, that it does really for quantum mechanics is it says, why should particles be probability distributions? Because that's what quantum mechanics assumes. Quantum mechanics starts with particles aren't really hard things, they're probability distributions. Mm -hmm. And based on how all this probability gets computed, you end up with a result. And quantum mechanics has been very, uh, it's been correct. The results they compute with the quantum mechanics, then they measure in an experiment and they get that result. So it's based on probability, but they don't have a, a clue as to why a particle should be a probability distribution to begin with. That's just an accepted, well, that's the way it is if you want to get the right answer, but there's no explanation. And that's why Feynman you know, told his students, just shut up and calculate. You know, uh, Don't ask me questions like that. But in this theory, it explains exactly why they have to be there. And the thing that's interesting is that it also explains relativity's core point, which is why the velocity of light's constant. Because once you know that the velocity of light's a constant, then special relativity is really just algebra. It's not even very high-level math. And then general relativity, of course, flows out of special relativity. So the key thing there is that the speed of light is a constant. That's what allows all these other tricky things like time dilation and length contraction. They all come out of this fact that even though you have a light source on a moving platform, the light that emitted is always constant, C. And uh, it's, it's invariant to the velocity of the source. And nobody knows, of course, why that is, because nothing else in this reality frame acts like that. Everything else, the velocities are additive or subtractive. You know, they depends on the platform. But in a virtual reality, you see that C is just in this virtual reality, it's moving data from one cell to the next. So you have little uh, uh, discrete quantum chunks of volume, if you will. And if you're going to move information from this chunk to this chunk to this chunk, as fast as you can do that is C. Mm -hmm. And it's a function of delta T going around. Every delta T, you can move it to the next chunk. You can't jump chunks and go someplace else. That's teleportation. And again, you get a funhouse reality. It's not, it's not buttoned down and consistent. You don't have continuity. Calculus goes away. All sorts of things don't work anymore if you don't have this continuity. So then that's why C is a constant. So it, it does, you know, it solves those problems that are the big, we don't know. Well, we can assume C is constant. We can work out all this wonderful relativity. And we can assume particles are probability distributions. And we work out all this quantum mechanics. But we really don't know why that ought to be that way. Mm -hmm. And then this explains why it's that way. And then it also explains the parallel well, So in a sense, it, uh, it, it's as though we're living in the, in the movie The Matrix. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, that, that's the sort of virtual reality that... Yeah, that that's a good out. Hollywood version of that, right. Uh, yeah. so, it, so then uh, what comes to mind is the, uh, the old uh, parable from Plato that we're, what we see of the world is a projection mm -hmm. of something behind. Right. Uh, just like looking at the movie The Matrix is Plato's cave all sure. over again. Sure. Uh, it, it also suggests that it, it should be possible to create an actual simulation on a computer mm -hmm. that that would demonstrate a lot what you're uh, what you're saying exactly. because the metaphor is very close. Mm -hmm. And that's true. And you know, people who work in consciousness and computers uh, mostly they they ha they seem to have mistaken idea that you can build consciousness into a computer, like you can somehow prog program a computer to be conscious, but it doesn't work like that. That is something that you, you can't do. What you do is you set, up the, you set up the environment that will support consciousness, and it just happens. You don't have to program it. All you have to do is give it the environment, give it the right stuff it needs, and what that is, is it has to be something that, that uh, makes decisions from experience. Mm. It, uh, those decisions can't be you know, algorithmic. They have to be fuzzy logic of some sort to where it takes in data. None of the data is so precise that it can give a deterministic, oh, here's the solution. The data is never quite enough to do that. So it has to say, well, 
eh, maybe this is the solution, or maybe that, or here's my probability on things being the solution, until it gets in more data. Well, data is called, the data input's called experience. So as it goes through its environment, it gets experience. That experience gets, gets uh, into knowledge, if you will, but it's tentative. The way you think things are kind of knowledge, and then it makes decisions. So if you can make that kind of a system, that's very simplistic. There's a few other things that it needs to be able to do. It needs to be self-changing. You know, it needs to be able to say, well, that didn't work out. I thought it would be this way, but now my more experience says that was a bad choice. So then it can change and do things differently. So it has to have some processing that assesses the results of its experience. It has to have a, uh, a goal, something it has to have, um, maybe a goal isn't the right way, but it needs criteria by which it can decide, is that good or is it better this other way? I mean, otherwise, anyway, is as good as any other way. You know? So it needs some sort of, some sort of uh, point to its existence. And in you know, biology, that point is what procreation and survival. In an information system, it's lower entropy. Create information. You know, shuffle, shuffle the digits to where they're more significant to you in some way. And, so it all could be simulated. Yes, it could all be simulated. You create the environment, and it will become conscious. It's not a, it's not a matter of, here's how we program consciousness, because as, as soon as you try to do that, you've restricted it to the algorithms, mm -hmm. and now you have some kind of deterministic thing that can't do anything but go through your code and come up with the same answer if you give it the same inputs, mm -hmm. and that's not consciousness, you see? So it's a matter of developing the right, uh, the right environment and then letting it be. Now, when you do that, you're not immediately going to get, you know, a consciousness that says, oh, hello, I'm the computer, you know. It's not going to be human consciousness. It might be consciousness like a bumblebee or consciousness, you know, like a dog or cat or at some other level, but it will be consciousness. It will be making decisions, and based on how those decisions play against the criteria of how it judges what it's doing, then it will modify and it will... If it has the capacity, you know, a bumblebee is conscious. Obviously, a dog's conscious. You know, by conscious, I mean it's sentient. It makes choices. Mm -hmm. If you poke it, it responds, and not just in a, not just because neurons are firing. It's not just in a programmed biological, you know, way. It responds by choice. It always has more than one choice of how to respond, and it can pick. One. And that's basically how I define free will. Free will is that you have this decision space, which is all the decisions that you might make. Not all the decisions that are possible for you to make, because some might be possible that you don't, aren't aware of. But there's all the ones you're aware of, and you get to make the choice which one you're going to do based on data that you get. So that kind of defines free will. So you can program free will, you see, in that sense. You can program it because you can program a thing that has choices, and it makes it based on its experience uh -huh. and what it's what is determined about that experience and uh, so then that's that's kind of you know the free will so all of this falls together and then you can it's just a real clear explanation like on your your uh, video your YouTube video where you were th at the um, in New York at the okay. Theosophical at Society the, yeah Theosophical Society you could spit that one out um, you went through a series of, of research uh, things that uh, had been done, and you had done most of them. At least other people may have started it, like the, uh, the very first one you talked about. What was that? The, uh, where you put the... the uh, oh, the Gonsfeld telepathy. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. yeah, that one where you put the ping pong balls over the eyeballs and so on. Um, all of those then have a... It's, you can derive them from this logic and say, yes, that'll happen, and yes, that explains that even to the point where sometimes you would get a reaction before the actual stimulus occurred. So, you know, where you expect this person to send a signal to that person and get a reaction, actually the second person in the chain starts to react before the first person in the chain gets the signal. And so how does the, the big toe explain that? Oh, well that, that comes out uh, for two, a couple of reasons. One is that there is in this, like in any digital, um, you know, virtual reality, you have a certain amount of video lag. Video lag is kind of the, the problem between when you, when you compute and when it actually happens, you know. So 
we have a lot of video lag in our systems because they have to go through from the server, you know, to the to the internet, you know, to a local server, into the computer, how fast your card is, and all that stuff creates video lag. Mm -hmm. In this reality, what creates video lag is what has evolved here, and again, evolved in the simulation. You might say in the you know, digital Big Bang. What's evolved in the simulation is these us. You know, well, this is our our uh, biology you know, evolution of our systems, but that's evolved in a in a simulation. Our evolution. Okay, so we have these real slow responding things called bodies. They're electrochemical. They're physical. They're levers and you know, tendons pulling, you know, muscles pulling on tendons that, you know, pull up arms. So you have, you know, you have levers, you have fulcrums, you have electrochemical things that get emitted by this gland and it moves down here and does something else so that you have these very slow processes compared to the system which runs these delta T's at about 10 to the minus 44 seconds per delta T. So that's small. You know, that's like, what, four orders of magnitude no, something like 30 orders of magnitude smaller than the smallest thing we can measure. So it's real, real tiny, 10 to the minus 44 seconds. So that's kind of the computation time, if you will. Mm -hmm. But now you have these very slow moving things going on. So there's a little video lag problem between the data stream and the action. One of the ways you speed that up is you look at the probable reality start the action moving before you actually get the stimulus so that by the time the stimulus comes you've gone through all the slow processes and actually start to see something that looks like it's with the stimulus. If you don't do that then we'd have this delay. Something would happen and not, you know, you'd sit there and stare blankly at it and then you'd start to move. So we have, a, we have that process that gets you out in front. And that's why, you know, what was it, like the readiness potential where they measure. If you go in and measure these little tiny, tiny uh, things in the musculature and in the secretions and so on, you start to see these reactions that precede the stimulus. That's getting the system going mm -hmm. so that it'll be moving. That's one, so that's, you know, kind of a video lag and the fact that there's this huge amount of time that it has to deal with. It's got billions and billions, actually four billions in a row, a billion, 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 billion cycles just you know, to get us up to a nanosecond of our real time. Okay. So that means it's got all this processing time and it knows the probable future very closely because we're only one, you know, times 10 to the minus 44 seconds to the next probable future. Well, if you're taking probable future leaps at that small a bound, it's not that hard to, you know, to guess what's going to happen next in the next, you know, one 10 to the minus 44th second. That's a pretty easy calculation to make if you have all the data. Mm -hmm. So it kind of knows what's going on. It knows what's happening. Uh, it can start the processes going. If it turns out that free will doesn't agree with what it thinks is happening, then it has to back up and deal with that. So we have free will. It thinks, well, he's going to do this, and instead it does that. Well, then you have to recalculate from there out for a while, but it's just that one instance, and that probably happens less than it happens. So this the other way. sounds like it, it might account for a couple of seconds, but what about cases of months or years of, of knowledge in advance? Well, that can happen, and I've had I've had uh, a fair amount of personal experience with those sorts of things, where things were told to me that were going to happen, but they're going to happen 14 years from now. You know that sort of thing. How does that work? Well, you have a you have a system that is trying to evolve, not die. We're part of that strategy to evolve. So the system has a vested interest in us succeeding. So now we have a friendly system, if you will, in, in as much as it would like us to, to you know, it can't just go in and move the pieces around. Obviously now it's bad science. You're not letting, you don't have free choice anywhere if you're going to move the pieces around. You have to let them do what they're going to do mm -hmm. for it to count. So, but you can nudge those pieces. You can do things not making the move for them, but you can nudge, and that's kind of where synchronicity comes from, where things are just kind of nudged into place so that you get just what you need, just at the time you, you needed it. And it all works out really well. And people who 
kind of live in the live in the moment and don't try to control and just kind of you know live that way find mostly that they get what they need things happen and, and it tends to be good and the system tends to nudge you this way or nudge you that way so you can predict something that's 14 years out and it's not that there's some deterministic process going on that, that makes that have to happen it's that if that's a goal the system can kind of nudge that into happening and if it doesn't always happen well that's not a disaster not a perfect system the system is not perfect this it sounds just works. a lot like the movie uh, the adjustment bureau <laughs> but, I mean, it yeah, sounds exactly that. like that yeah. Yeah. because it's they're they're watching uh, a system play out over time, mm -hmm. and their job is to nudge. Yeah. But they can't. They don't. They don't override can't control. Well. Right. It's like that. So the system can do that, and it can. You know, a lot of times when people have these paranormal experiences, you know, the the mother suddenly knows that her child her child is hurt somewhere, and she just knows it, and it turns out that it's true. You know, many of these, these kinds of experiences aren't really so much about the experience itself. It's about kind of opening the eyes of that individual. It's like it's, it's more about that individual than it is about the fact that the child's hurt. Okay. They know about it. They can go. They can interact with it. But most of the time, the child would have been all right. Somebody's taking care of that over there. This connection's made because it helps that person and the persons around them that understand it and know about it and it makes sense to them, it helps them see a bigger picture. So a lot of that stuff that just happens. I had a, an engineer friend of mine who was, have said that it was very, very straight. You know, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist or it isn't, it isn't important. And uh, he uh, one night had a dream where he saw an airplane full of people. He was a kind of engineer that understood airplanes and he knew the makes and the models and those kinds of things, a technical guy. And he saw this airplane and says, oh, that's a such and such a make and, and model. And he saw the people on it. And he, it was maybe 100 people. And they were all in black and white except one little girl who was in color. And he looked at them, lots of detail. He says, just as much detail if he was there. It wasn't a dreamy kind of foggy thing. It was precise, like photographic. Two days later, a plane crashed. Everybody was killed but one little girl. Same plane, you know, same make, same model. And at that point, his life changed. You see, he became interested in finding out more about the larger reality. Mm -hmm. And you've heard stories like that, I'm sure, you know, hundreds of times. Mm -hmm. Things happen, and suddenly people get interested. They become seekers. You know, they, they, they know now that it isn't just physical, objective reality, that there's something else going on there that's bigger, and then that starts a process. And many of those things happen. You know, why? It wasn't really about those people. It wasn't really about you know, what was going on. Sometimes somebody will, will look at their facts and they get a message from Uncle Fred that's been dead a week, you know, sitting on the fax machine, or they pick up the phone and they hear somebody from, you know, it's, from, that's passed on. So, in any case, these things are just things that um, are here to help wake us up, for the most part. They don't mean anything special in and of themselves other than to the individual that experiences them, because it's only really real for them and a few people close to them that they have credibility with. So a lot of things like that. So yeah, I was told, I was told, uh, uh, who, you know, basically, uh, you know, when I was going to be married, the number of children I would have and that sort of thing, decades ahead of when it actually happened. And when it happened, there, there it was. And again, it's, it's, it was just something I think that would help me, you know, help verify for me that that's the kind of system we're in. When that started to unfold, did you get the sense that uh, you had to let it go continue in that way? Or that, like, it, is there a sense of uh, predestination? Well, you have, you have a sense that, that it's right, you know, that it go that way. Hmm. You have the free will to say, no, you know, I don't want that, and turn around and run, and that wouldn't happen. Well, so or you, it, you have, it would still happen <laughs> in some other way. That, perhaps. Yeah. Perhaps it would, you know, that's, that's often true. If you deny one, you know, something will blossom on the other side. Right. You heal somebody's cancer and then you get run over in a week, you know, by a car or something. You're not really changing the outcome so much as you're just modifying it. Right. But in, some, in that case, I had the sense that when I got in a situation where the bells were ringing, you know, the deja vu, the, the you know, yeah, I think this is important, 
I'm not sure why, but I just got this sense that you know, I need to do this and be that way. The sense was if I didn't do it, it wouldn't be right. Mm -hmm. you know, it was that kind of a thing. So it was, again, nudging as opposed to somebody making decisions for you. Mm -hmm. But the neat thing is, is not only does it explain these, these um, paranormal things, because all of the things that you talked about would have been deductive, if you will, from this theory. You could say, well, yeah, that's why that is, and yeah, that should work that way. And if I didn't know the answer, I could predict what the answer would be. Mm -hmm. But that's, so that's kind of the paranormal end of it. But the neat thing is that it tells you, well, why are particles probability distributions? And why is C constant? And how is it that people can modify so what, what statistics? what aspect of the big toe is falsifiable? There's lots of parts of it that are falsifiable. There's any number of pieces of research that could be done, and some of them simply done, just to say whether it works that way or not. Can you give an example? Well, yeah. In, uh, here's an example. In, you know, we have this thing called uh, reverse causality. And there really is no such thing as reverse causality. It just appears to be reverse causality. And one of the ways this is done is that you take a, uh, you can take a computer, it's a simple way of doing it, the way it's been done. You take a uh, computer and make random numbers. And you make lists of random numbers. And nobody looks at the list, but there's just lists of random numbers. And then you can get people with an intent to say, let's try to make this list have a an average on a random number a little higher than that list, or make this list lower, you know, bias it. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a principle I call psi uncertainty principle. You can't move it any more than what's in the natural uncertainty of the process. I mean, all processes are going to have plus or minus, you know, error, error bars along with it. So you can move it with your intent within the natural uncertainty. And you say, well, then that doesn't prove anything, but it does if you can do that 10 times in a row, that the ones you want to bias up tend to be up ever so slightly, right. and the ones you do put down, that's like flipping a coin ten times in a row and getting heads. So it becomes very improbable that that's chance. So that's the sort of thing. And the reason it's called um, reverse causality is that these lists can be old. You see, you can take these lists, and they can be a year old, locked away someplace, and then you bring them out. And now people can look at it, and these can drop a little, or those can go up a little, and they can affect it. Uh, it's been done with hospital records, it's been sure. done with uh, uh, decaying uh, Geiger counters and a, and a radioactive decay, it's the same sort of thing. Well, what's going on there is that intent is modifying probable future. Probable future hasn't really happened yet. You see, people say, well, it has. That data's, you know, a year old. It's done. It's, it's here, but it's not here because it's never been rendered here. It's not real data, just like that electron going through the double slit mm -hmm. until it's a measurement renders it here. Once it's here, then it has to stay here. Right. So where's the falsifiable aspect? Well, I'm getting, I'm getting to that. I'm sorry. I have to. It's, <laughs> it's different enough that if I don't give some of the. Well, of course, I'm completely familiar with all this because yeah. I've done those experiments. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but maybe those the people, is not, those people, so those people are probably <laughs> not. Yeah. If it's a, if you have data, okay. Let's say we have uh, um, twenty thousand pieces of data. We break it up into um, 2,000, 10, 2,000 chunks of data, mm -hmm. okay? And then we take those, those 2,000 chunks of data and separate those into 1,000 chunks of data, all right? So now we can look at the, this, of this two 1,000 chunks, we can make this one higher and that one lower and so on. But now look at this. If, if we're going to, if, if this is just information, here's some fals falsifiable experiments you can do. You know, let's say that you, that you take this, these, this 2,000 of data and you look at what the average is of, both, of all that data, okay? Now, let somebody try to move this one higher and what will happen to the other one? It has to go lower by the same amount, you see? That's very falsifiable. It either does or it doesn't, right? Now, you can take the whole ensemble of data, all 20,000 of them, take an average there. Well, you can modify this one and that one and this one and the other one. This is because you partially collapse it. I mean, you're constraining yeah, it. Yeah, you're constraining it and uh -huh. you're doing these partial collapses as you go. Because what's important, just like the double slit, is when, when you actually take the measurement, which means you go add up what's the average number from these streams of random numbers, that's when you collapse you know, the wave function and get a result that's now in this physical reality. Before, mm -hmm. it was just a probable result, you see? Mm -hmm. So you can arrange, you can, you can change the constraints on it any number of ways to show that 
what's really going on here is that you have a digital reality. You're modifying the probability with intent, and by as you put constraints on it, they can do different sorts of things. Mm -hmm. If you look at the average of the ensemble, then they can change all the ones in between, but in a, you know, over the whole, it's got to hit that number that's already been collapsed into this reality frame. So that would be a whole set of experiments, not too hard to do, that would uh, kind of show mm -hmm. this, this process. In the 19, uh, see the late 60s or early 70s, there it was a theory developed by a number of uh, parapsychologists called the observational theories, which, mm -hmm. which basically is the same idea, that observation acts to change the probabilities of quantum events. Mm -hmm. And that gave rise to a whole rash of different kinds of experiments of the type that you're describing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it, in fact, all of it really has to do with the way that you constrain how a system behaves by your observation. Right. So right. The, many of those actually have already been yeah. done. That's good. Do they, do they verify the? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So that's, so it's like with the double slit, it's not the fact that somebody measures the data, because you can measure the data and then erase it, and you get a different value than if you have the data and don't erase it. And both times you've measured the data. One time you've erased it, now you're back to the diffraction pattern. And the reason that tells you that it's not the actual act of measurement, it's not actually the consciousness that did the measurement, it's the fact of whether or not the information is in this reality frame or not to create a, a conflict with what happens later. You know, what happens later can't be in conflict with what, okay, you, so with what you've got. Okay, so we've been doing experiments with a double slit system now for about four years and mm -hmm. we're continuing to do so. We, we do it in two different conditions. One, uh, you get feedback as to the state of how much collapse has occurred, mm -hmm. in immediate feedback as a result of processing that we're doing on, in real time. Mm -hmm. But there's another condition where you don't get any feedback. So if you're mm -hmm. a, mentally observing a double slit system mm -hmm. at a distance with no feedback, mm -hmm. what, what, what would... Depends on what your intent is. What's your intent for well, that if system? You, if it, well, your, your intent is that it would, it would collapse. Okay, so if, you have an function, so if you have an intent, and if your intent is focused on a system that has uncertainty in it, you know, it could be this way, it could be that way. You know, it's little tiny things that make a difference in those, you know, we're only talking about moving things, uh, you know, half a wavelength to make a big difference in how things work. So you have a lot of, of uncertainty. Well, where there's lots of uncertainty, intent can get a pretty good grip because there's lots of ways it could be. So now the intent can be fairly effective where there's so lots of uncertainty. So it, uh, uh, intent alone without observation or without? Intent will modify the future probability then when you make the observation, you collapse that future probability. If you've changed the probability well, with the intent. So well, it's then the, then it okay, so, so the intent can push the probabilities around you. You may right. or may not get a certain result, but if you don't bring it into this reality, as, right. as you were saying. It's then, still just potential. So you need feedback at some point. If you want to, you know, well, the probability will have been changed, okay? But whether or not you actually, that makes a difference, the way we get things in the system, the way you get a particle or a wave, is you go into a, a probability distribution of what is, po you know, here's, what, here's, a, here's what's possible and here's the probability of it being. Mm -hmm. So you go into that distribution, you randomly select one. Then that that's then becomes part of this physical reality. That's here then. So what, you're, what we're saying then is you've modified the probability, you skewed this distribution, but you've never done the measurements, you've never made the observation, so you never pick. Well, and there's no result other than you've skewed the probability. So the probability's been skewed, and if there's any other thing going on, any other forces in play that would re-skew it or do something else to it, then it might move again. But uh, so what I'm, if not, I'm it would stay skewed. So what I'm trying to get at here is something like another form of falsifiability here, because there are lots of theories uh, having to do with intentional effects on the world that require mm -hmm. feedback. For, for this very reason, that you, something about consciousness or the mind or whatever mm -hmm. it is uh, pushes probabilities around, but the probabilities are just sitting there like a superposition without actually doing anything, and it has to manifest. Yeah. And so the manifesting is the feedback that the person gets 
to close this loop between intention and observation. Yeah. Even if they don't close the loop, though, it will have that effect. If they if they focus but on if you don't measure it, how would you know that? No, some, no, I'm saying you don't have to necessarily feed it back to the person doing it. Somebody with the else. Intent. Somebody else somebody, would work. Okay. You see. So, uh, so if you don't make the observation, then you don't have any data. So okay. there there somebody is nothing in this physical. Somebody at some point has to get feedback in order to collapse the system that is or it's not part of this reality I got it as okay. long as it's in probability it's not in this physical reality what about what, what is it what do you frame. say then about the like the distance between the person giving the intent and the person who's seeing the the final feedback is makes, there anything makes no difference okay makes no difference at all this is a in this um, larger consciousness system there is no such thing as distance or space it's um, you know it's an information field now we visualize that as a bunch of things that are spatially distributed because that's the way we, you know, it's our habit, the way we have to see things, that's our experience. We, right. we can't visualize it any other way, but there is no distance there. It's just an information field. So, it do, you know, distance is not a, is not really a parameter that makes any, any sense there. It's just information. And the information doesn't really have to travel distances. There's just metaphors we use to, you know, to put it into language. Mm -hmm. So no, it shouldn't make any difference, and it won't make any difference whether those people are in shielded rooms or not in shielded rooms, unless they think it'll make a difference. Then their intention changes. If their intention is this is impossible, I can't do this now. Yeah, this is one they of the reasons they won't that work. You know, won't work very well. This is one of the reasons why, uh, from a mainstream scientist point of view, they're always suspicious about psychic phenomena because nothing matters. Now, what you're saying is there are parameters that can get pushed around, but if you have a combination of Intention pushing probabilities in a non-local way, right? Then anything goes. And yeah, in pretty which much. Case, then, it, but yeah, that's the whole anything point. goes within certain limits of the amount of uncertainty and so on. You know, well, it, which you, is you, everything. So well, well, you know, let's, let's take for instance another good example is you have um, uh, Bill. Is that right, Bill Tillman? Tiller. Tiller. Bill Tiller looks at a beaker of water or somebody does in his lab and tries to raise or lower the pH and the pH can creep up or creep down depending on the intent. Mm -hmm. Well, the way that works is that the pH of a glass of water isn't a, isn't a constant. If you had a, a pH at five decimal places, you'd see in the last three or four of those decimal places, it'd be, going, it'd be doing this all the time. Right. There's uncertainty there. Well, within that uncertainty, he can modify the probability of what's going to happen next. So he raises it a little bit and then he's got a pH that's now 0.01, whatever, higher than it was, but now that's the state, and he can raise that in a little bit. So if he keeps at it, he can just walk it up a little delta T or a little delta pH at a time until he can measure it, and he's got a whole pH or a half a pH or something massive. He can't just look at it, and suddenly he's got a, a pH. See, right. that won't uh, work. It's all about pushing Maxwell's demon around. He has, to, he has to work it up, you know, by the natural uncertainty in the you know, in that system, right. and he can he can change that. So then you do the measurement. He changes it, and you what, do what the measurement. What about this as a, uh, as a kind of an experiment? Uh, if you have two people who have competing intentions, mm -hmm. and uh, and they're pushing on the same probability distribution, I wonder if you can show that two intents will create a kind of a churning in the probabilistic state of the system, whereas one would would produce less and maybe three people would have even more churning. Now, I don't know exactly what churning in a probability mm -hmm. distribution looks like, but I'm imagining something like, uh, like, like a chaotic system where you mm -hmm. would normally have a, a reasonably well-patterned uh, mm -hmm. binomial or, or Gaussian distribution, but when you start put having people push on it, you end up with things that have funny bumps right. in it. Mm -hmm. you, would you expect something like yeah. that to be yes, so? Yes, you would, and it would, be, it would depend on who the individuals were, how much, how much power, let's say, they have in their intent. Again, power being a, a metaphor. Okay, how much power they have in their intent. Somebody who can focus well will have much more power than somebody whose mind is flying around and not focused. So if you had a person who had really good focus and a person who didn't have much and they were pushing in opposite directions, well, the person who had more focus would just overwhelm the person that didn't. But if you had people of relatively equal focus, pushing at an event, then yes, you'd, you'd find it, you're so you, going so to you, make bumps, so you you're going to make up, bumps in it. You'd have something like a Gaussian distribution uh, that would end up being bimodal. 
in which case if two people are doing an experiment with opposite, about the same intention, yeah. whatever that means, you should get larger variance. If they're pushing at each other, yeah, you get a larger variance yeah. because it would, it would, uh, it would split the, the it would kind of change this way pieces. some and that way, and it would be, uh, yeah. Well, there's a doable experiment. Yeah.